when I got into Rent, which had somewhat to do with what was happening with Rent at the time, but in the world of the theater, we're a part of the making. Like, I'm not in any way claiming that we're making it. Other people are making it, but you know them, and they are really accessible to you, and you can talk to them and interact with them, and they ask you questions, and you're like, why are you asking me? Like, I'm the art director here. Welcome to Architecture, Design, and Photography. This is our COVID-19 setup. Today, we are speaking with Drew Hodges, a creative director known for his celebrated branding and advertising campaigns for Broadway shows, including Hamilton, Chicago, and Rent. Holy cow. Uh, in 1987, Hodges founded Spot Design, followed by the full-service New York advertising agency, Spot Co., focused on the theatrical industry. Hodges currently runs Drew Design Co. and is also a professor at the Maine College of Art. Our interview today is sponsored by Maine Home Design. Don't miss Hodges' design theory article in the upcoming July issue of Maine Home Design. Drew, thank you for coming in and talking with me today. Happy to be here under under imaginary July circumstances. Oh, yes. We're both short-sleeved. and yeah, we're uh, in the July. We're just keeping our distance here because it's so hot out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, not that there's some virus floating in the air trying to kill us all, but... Whatever, we'll make the best of it. But uh, definitely appreciate you coming in and uh, and doing this over a, a ten foot distance. <laughs> so um, it was really interesting to look through this book. By the way, Drew has a book out with uh, Rizzoli that you can see there. I'll put it right under your head uh, on Broadway from Rent to Revolution. Drew Hodges, um, an immense amount of work that you have done. It incredible. Thank you. Just Thank you. a huge amount. Um, I've, I am drastically under socialized when it comes to going to events. I'm just not that person <laughs> for some reason, and I've never been to a Broadway show. But I have seen a huge amount of your work just in in marketing and advertising. And um, wow, Rent, Chicago, and Hamilton. Those are Very like lucky. crazy, great, great projects. I uh, always say to people like, you should make a book because it's a total joy to, uh, you know, you can really make a book. I mean, Bertoli is a great publisher and I'm very lucky to be with them, but you can now kind of make your own book in a way you couldn't before. Right. And I have to say, one of the great joys of that book is there's so much work that's been made. You make a bunch of designs and then one gets picked and the other 15, they only really exist now digitally. Right. You know, and then not even, I mean, you know, no kidding, but I mean, there was a lot of work in that book that were on digital formats that we thought, okay, can we open these files anymore? Can we even, you know, zip drives? And, you know, <laughs> so you know, not for nothing, it was a great way to have a record of a lot of work that would never have been seen. And now right. I feel like, okay, when the zip drives all break, it, it won't matter because at least there's a printed record. Right. So I always said it to people, you know, like, Get on it, Trent. Like, get your book out there. It would be a great book. Well, I, interestingly, I thought about putting out uh, my my draw of architecture is in a very minimalist, modern aesthetic. Yeah. And I thought about putting out a book like Main Modern or something to yeah, that. You're already there. Let's yeah. go. Let's go. You and I. I'll help you lay it out. I, you don't really I, need my help laying it out, but yeah, you should make that book. That well, book doesn't exist. I love the idea, and I I love the uh the aesthetic that the the modern architecture of maine uh portrays because it, it used like my own house is very it's sited in cedar and feels very rustic but very minimal and and uh kind of museum-esque quality at the same time it's it's very I weird i think how like that aesthetic would lend itself obviously the photography is already great but it would lend itself so well to the design of the book Oh, to make yeah. this really sleek book that feels like, ooh, I want to touch this book in a bookstore. Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's uh, there, there's a mystique to Maine that the rest of the country feels that it's a, it's a, you know, it's the Alaska of the East Coast. There's a, there's an unknown to it, and and there's uh, there's so many parts of it that are so beautiful that are so hard to get to. So it, it has that, um, it's a quality that surfing has, that it's a very fleeting moment that you can capture, uh, to find. And so like all these nooks and crannies and islands, like, wow, if I could just go explore that little place. And so it has that 
continual draw on that degree. But I, I did think about doing a book for a while. And I'm, I'm one of those people who gets ideas and is like, could really do it creatively, but I need, I need to hire a producer, someone who has that really go get them, stay on task, continually put the creative problems in front of me to, to fix and solve and finish, but keep me on track. You know, someone who has that drive outside of me to, to finish all these ideas that I get. So I'll have to make an investment in that eventually, but <laughs> you could do it. Well, this is not the forum, but let's discuss how to do it. I think you could do it through Mecca in a really great way. You really? Could, yeah, I think you could get a teacher and a class and uh, uh, or a, an intern, you know, to spend a yeah, summer putting this book together for you and at a really reasonable price. I'm uh, one thing you'll see is I'm a big advocate for having more real world experience from the art students in Maine. That mm -hmm. I think there's this idea. Either that New York is New York and Maine is Maine and they're somehow so far apart. And of course, Maine has its own ideas about New York. And I was in New York for 34 years. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I go back and forth between New York and Maine all the time. I do work in both places. I'm yeah. constantly defending one to the other <laughs> in the creative process. I have that conversation ways. with so many clients like in Boston and, and New York. They're like, why do you live in Maine? And it's it's the same reason that artists took over old industrial spaces. There's uh, a freedom of it. It hasn't been done yet. It, it doesn't have a massive price tag on it. That I think there's an is ease a, of creation. I, yeah. I started to use that phrase of like, you can find a space and have it be reasonably cost. You know, I've, right. I've been called on that occasionally, but I still say, no, no, no. The comparison is extraordinary on what your rent is, what your space oh, yeah. is. And and you can find uh, collaborators. You know, it's yep. also very easy to uh, I, I I was I sat in a salon for a while that a friend of mine drove that was really about getting creative people to network with each other mm -hmm. um, that happened over Thompson's Point. And it was interesting because it, it had to do with people who sort of couldn't off, I would say it was toughest for people who couldn't kind of do work from away. You have to be there. Right. So, mm -hmm. and I was always getting work from New York. Yeah. And so my situation was so different, but you know, my, you know, what used to get said to me was, Oh, but you, you get, you know, you get your work from New York. And I said, okay, I don't know anybody really who gets their creative work locally. Like at this point, right. You know, I mean, I would just sat in and, and did a crit on an illustration class. And I said to them, you know, by the way, I probably haven't been in the same space with an illustrator in 15 years. You know, I mean, they mm. they live everywhere. Great that they live everywhere. They're all in We're Bali. We're not really on interested beach. <laughs> in where they live. You don't even know half the time. Right. Uh, you know, you usually find out when you want to know what time schedule they're on. So you don't call somebody too early or too late. Right. And that's really not a problem because you just want to talk to people and do the work. And it's so easy to work nationally or internationally. You know, I love, I love doing main work and I've sort of been working up to it. Um, I have a couple big projects now this year that are here, oh, but great. I don't really make a distinction. Can you talk about any of them at this point? Or are they still kind of, uh... well, uh, not so much. Okay. <laughs> we'll have you back. In the <laughs> well, that, uh, that's been, this, there's a big one coming out uh, in the fall that I can cool. talk about then. All right, cool. Um, so you, you rose to some remarkable levels of success with your uh, ad, essentially ad agency, I guess is what mm -hmm. you'd call it. The focus that's niche was Broadway. And you worked on national uh culturally significant to the highest degree projects uh and you were responsible for their branding image and marketing and everything else which is incredible um why you why how did you get there because that's really valuable information for people who are starting out or wanting to improve what they're currently doing uh, can you can you give me three traits of why on earth Drew Hodges got well, there? Well, first, I think I should explain how it happened. Okay, because it'll be self evident. But then we'll, we'll I'll, I'll I'll hit you with the traits thing. And thank you for such a lovely setup. Uh, you know, you don't 
honestly, part of my career has been trying to take Broadway from a situation that people saw as a real niche market mm -hmm. to a kind of national brand. And I think that's happened. Hamilton is literally, I think, the pinnacle of that idea that there was an idea about America that became um, a national conversation. And yeah, that yeah. was a thing that when I started on Broadway was not happening. And Broadway was sort of like seen as, you know, kind of the, the they uh, literally there's a phrase in New York, they call it the fabulous invalid. Like mm -hmm. that it was sort of like struggling along based on an old school idea of what, you know, I, there's still that. I still run into people who are like Broadway, that kind of thing. So, so that, that fits in what's going to, I'm going to tell you what happened to me. So I, I went to school of visual arts. I was lucky enough to work for a very prominent graphic designer named Paula Cher and her studio from my senior year out for about three years. And so I worked on kind of rock and roll things. I worked on Swatch. Uh, I worked on, I guess, some albums. She has a rock and roll background, Paula does. Mm -hmm. So then I went out on my own and had a small design studio and it was just me. And, and you were working primarily as a graphic design. I'm a graphic who, designer. Yeah. I'm not an ad agency. And I'm one person, then I'm two. Eventually we're five people over about 10 years. Mm -hmm. What and were the first five that you hired, if you don't mind me asking? One of the first five people I hired? Yeah, they? like position wise. They were all, I had one, I had a office manager what would now be a CFO, a chief yep. financial yep. officer. But at the time he would have laughed and would say he was a bookkeeper and he worked two days a week freelance. Okay. So I don't even know if I'm counting him as part of the five. All the others were designers. Okay. So it was just, we were all designers. That's the task we did. Everybody finished their own work. There was no, you know, that's what we did. We were all graphic designers in a small apartment in Chelsea area of New York City. And I started, I worked quite a bit on cable, um, like MTV was, you know, and at that time there were cable brands that were launching. So it was yeah. MTV and Comedy Central, and Nickelodeon and Turner, all that happened in that time period. This is... Uh, 87 and 97. It's interesting. I think cable had like a what, like 30 year heyday. And I would imagine now it's kind of hitting skids a bit with the internet, but I don't know. I, I mean, you know, I, they're all, you know, there are so many places that everybody's, you know, everybody's trying to stake their own claim. Right. But I, and honestly, I haven't done a cable job in 20 years, so yeah. I'm not yeah. sure, but way off topic. So, I, but anyway, <laughs> but, but, so that I did rock and roll. Like I literally did like MTVMs and things like that for yep. people. And so I did a bunch of other people. And then that got me record work. And I started to do some packaging, which were really CDs, not albums. And um, that culminated in a couple albums for Geffen Records, which then became DreamWorks Records. Mm -hmm. And David... Uh, and I can talk a little bit about what that was like, because it's different than you think it was. And then, but I was happy to do it. And then David Geffen had invested in Broadway shows before, Cats, some other things. Mm -hmm. And so he invested in Rent. And so he asked his creative director, a woman named Robin Sloan, that's a really storied career and the whole and Nirvana and you know, like, uh, smells like teen spirit. Like she did that video. I mean, uh -huh. come on. um, she hired me cause I had just finished an Aerosmith album for her and she hired me to go work on rent. Now, before we get to rent, like when you do an Aerosmith album, like how involved are you? Do you, is it basically like, here's the album, listen to it, conceptualize, make a pitch or how does that work? So that's a really great question because it leads into what I wanted to say. So right. I could think strategically, I always had that ability, which is part of, which is a thing that I had to have in order to become an ad agency. So it wasn't just the aesthetic. It was like, why should we make this? Why shouldn't we make this? 
Mm -hmm. And, but one of the great training grounds about cable was you really had to understand the difference in the brand personality of a cartoon network versus a Nickelodeon. Right. About like, I mean, those slices of the pie were very thin and very mm -hmm. near each other. So you had to understand the difference between Patty Ski Alpha and Bonnie Raitt and what was the difference and in, in, in who that persona was. So we right. got good at creating tone, you know, creating a kind of personality for the stuff that we worked on and understanding what that personality needed to be, to be appropriately that kind of project. Right. And, and you ref, uh, distilled that personality from the personality. You Yeah. In some cases you were literally a part of, like we were part of the launch of Comedy Central. So everyone was figuring out, this is way before Jon Stewart. Everyone's figuring out, okay, what will this personality be? Mm -hmm. And other people are doing that, but you are a part of it. And then in other cases, it exists and you come into it and you learn to riff with it, whether MTV or whatever. I mean, right. obviously, you know, I did not invent the Aerosmith persona. Right. It doesn't right. take a lot to imagine what that is. But like the album I had done just before that was Lisa Loeb's first album, you know, the yeah. one with the hits on it, you know of. Mm -hmm. And so she's an unknown brand and you're working on her, basically her debut album, not counting, you know, alt. Um, and so solving the brand was something we were good at. But the thing that was fascinating about what happened with Rent was in, um, and of course I know now Rent is Rent, but at the time Rent is a project, it's another thing. It's like, oh, cool. But what I had come to find on the entertainment stuff I worked on was you get further and further away from anybody who's making anything, right? I mean, the reality is the Aerosmith album, and I always say it on purpose because it's both impressive, but it's in fact exactly the answer to why I didn't dig it anymore because it was their last album on the label. They were moving to a new label. It was a live album, so which is how you finish out your contract deal is when you right. don't want to go back in the studio and record another album for that label, you want to record on the new album that has better numbers for you. You push out this live album as the last thing. And that's what they did. And I had one about 19 second phone conversation with Steven Tyler as he walked through a parking garage because his voice was really echoing. And I was like, where are you? And he's like, oh, some parking garage. And then he's like, I think it looks good. And then like done. So I had no, you know, your ideas of what it would be like to make an Iris with album cover. You're working with the marketing team. I didn't even ever even speak to the manager. I mean, I was a layer down a layer, down a layer, down a layer. And that right. was a good gig, but there was no interaction with you know, so let me understand this album and what it means to you and what you're thinking and what you're feeling. Right. Yeah, yeah, no, like that didn't happen at all. So the, and that was okay. But then amazingly, when I got into Rent, which had somewhat to do with what was happening with Rent at the time, but beyond that, in the world of the theater, we're a part of the making. Like I'm not in any way claiming that we're making it. Right, Other right. people are making it, but you know them and they're really accessible to you and you can talk to them just, and right, interact right, with right. them. And they ask you questions and you're like, why are you asking me? Like I'm the art director here. And they're There's like- There's just fewer and fewer people involved and it's just the a direct- arena allows for it. They yeah. don't say, go away, you advertising person. Like you, over the years also, you work with people again- More of again. a partner. To a degree. You build a trust and you become, a, and what I fell in love with was being a part of that process. And also the other thing that I fell in love with was actually being responsible for and understanding the business side of it, like as mm. an ad agency. And we can talk, and we should talk more about the difference between being a, I was a design studio that became an ad agency over literally a two week period. Like it was like <laughs> we shut down and we reopened. Yeah. But to be an ad agency is to be responsible for the, and Broadway is to be responsible and a part of the numbers they're selling every week. Mm -hmm. And every show you work on is a startup, is an independent LLC. It's like starting up a restaurant or, or sure. a clothing store. And you know, how are we doing this week is like a very real thing. These are the numbers. How are we going to be over the July 4th weekend? Are we, right. What are we going to do about the July 4th weekend? Are we going to be down? Or are we going to be up? Are we gonna now, before we go too far, describe to me the difference between a design studio and ad agency. Yeah, yeah. I love 
this because people don't actually know and it should be known, particularly by students. Um, design students get paid on a fee basis. Um, you know, you're going to do that logo for me. Thank you. I'd like that to be $4,000 or $24,000 or whatever it is. Um, ad agencies in the past, and it's changing now, but in the past, they typically get paid on a percentage of media bought. Sure. So if you're buying a $100,000 ad in the New York Times, which is basically what a full page ad costs, you're getting theoretically 15% of that media that you, so you, you make $15,000 on that ad. Mm -hmm. um, those numbers are changing. Lots of agencies, uh, a lot of agencies now have split between some people do media and some people do creative and those creative people are frankly paid much more like a design studio now, but we were still in that structure. So, um, so the reality was in order to, so I was five people as a design studio and reopened as an ad agency with 12 people because that's how many more people I needed to do the things that an ad agency does, which is not just strategy, but actual financial execution. So an ad agency buys media mm. or can, there are now many that only do creative like via here in, in Portland, Maine, um, or some that only do media, um, and there's aggregate strength and things like that. But basically, I reopened with media buyers and strategy people who could take your budget and you could say, I've got this, I've got $500,000 in media to launch this Broadway show. And we would plan that out and say, okay, we want to start here and this many direct mail pieces. And then we'll be a billboard in Times Square and then this much in the New York Times and then there's radio. And, and at this point, it's now, obviously there are many, 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 many more choices when I started, you were kind of in the New York Times and on TV some. Right. Maybe you were in Times Square with a billboard. Now, you're on every social platform. You've got your own web. You've got you know you've got a many many more pieces, a much more fractured media buy. But you mm -hmm. still are required to be really uh, savvy and um, strategic as right. to how you're spending someone's advertising dollar, and then what's the creative that you're putting into those same spaces. So it's right. both media planning, media execution, and the brand itself. So when someone comes to you and says, I have 500,000 for media, that mostly means where you're going to be putting the creative you've already created. And uh, the length of time and of where time. and yep. the frequency, because really in advertising, they talk about sort of frequency is a big issue in advertising. How often will I be seen? How many people will see me? And mm -hmm. are those people, what everybody's hoping to do is pay money to only get to the lowest amount of wasted money. So basically, right. so I said that kind of sloppily, but the bottom line is you don't really want to send your message wider than you have to, because you're paying to do that. So right. you're trying to get in front of people who might be interested in what you're doing and not in front of people who would never dream of going to a Broadway show. Like you would be a terrible buy since you've yeah. never been to one. Yeah. No, I, I, I don't ever go unless someone else is really adamant about it. Otherwise I'd rather like sit at home and contemplate the universe which is totally great <laughs> but like you're not my customer yeah yeah you know, i've yeah. never been my customer so yeah that's what you're doing is you're figuring out what you want to say my favorite part of it i mean i can do that part of it although we hired other people to do that and they're better at it than me but my favorite part of it is to figure out the voice right what i mm -hmm. love to do is figure out a, a unique voice what i like to call the emotional promise that's sort of right that's one of the age. questions i have is the emotional promise in the event and how do you distill down to that voice so you take a project say rent how do you distill it down to its voice its emotional promise in the event what what is your process in that so rent and was, if you could describe what you mean by event emotional promise and voice I will. rent was different in that um the easiest thing to do is make yourself the customer, right? If you're mm -hmm. talking to you, that's easy, right? You right. do it almost instinctively. You mm -hmm. you just kind of get the vibe and you're like, yeah, yeah, that, that feels right. And that's what most people, you know, who start their own small business do. They, they are the customer. 
they have a general sense of how, whether it's, you know, Patagonia or I don't know, you know, pick some other people. Like I think they begin the vibe, the aesthetic is there. It's them. Yeah. And so they just, they can feel it. It oozes them. So and- rent was me. So, and I'll, I'll talk some more about that. I'll, I'll go back. But um, over time you start to try and figure out how to do it when it's not you, you know, where you really are looking at who's right. coming to this. And that's where we get into the emotional promise. Cause I don't think people want to know what's going to happen. Really? They don't really want to know what the plot point is. Yeah. You don't want to spoil it for them. But, well, even if you did in a movie trailer is always interesting that way. Cause they get more into like, this is what's going to happen. Mm. I think on a Broadway show, or at least what I put forward was people want to know how it's going to feel to be there. Right. They just want to like, what do you, what, you know, is it going to be sexy? Is it going to be funny? Is it going to be sophisticated? Is it going to be no coward? Is it going to be modern? Like they just, they want to know like what, so that they can self-select so they can say, yeah, that interests me. I mean, the people who are making that interest me or the vibe you're, you know, the thing you're about interests me or the thing it's based on interests me. I love that. A lot of more set album, you know, there are different ways in and sometimes the event or the emotional promise, and they're kind of the same thing, but I I use them in different ways. The event is defined by me as how you'll tell somebody else what it was, literally. Mm. I try and figure out, okay, if I'm going to tell you what Hamilton is like, I have to really think that, you know, I want to know, if I want you to tell somebody else what Hamilton is like, then I try and think about how I want you to do that right. and how you're most likely to do that. Because everything is word of mouth. Everything is now sold word of mouth. Everything is encouraged by word of mouth. There's no reason to do much that someone hasn't said, yeah, that's a cool thing. No, that's not a cool thing. And right. certainly something as emotional as a Broadway show, people want to say, ah, I saw this thing, this thing, it rocked, this thing was amazing, this thing was beautiful, this thing was moving, or I hated it, it was so boring. So, um, and it might be boring to one and not to another. So sure. part of it is sort of putting out a vibe that matches well. Um, so I think the emotional promise is figuring out all the things a show could validly say is a great reason to go. And then editing and finding which one of those. So let's, what I literally do is I try and pull a list together of like, here are all the reasons you might want to do this, right? Here right, right. are the reasons. Um, I did a TED talk recently where I actually I watched literally it last went night. through the, yeah. the rent reasons you might want to go. And then I try and look at them all and reorder them into which ones are, have a broader appeal versus like, yeah, that's true, but that's a little bit obscure. Then I try and look at which things I thought I could communicate well, because sometimes things are really fascinating about a project. However, they're not so easy to get someone to get it, right? Some Mm -hmm. things are like quite sophisticated, but like you could love the subtlety of something. You could love the complexity and the indecision of a character. Okay, that's a really difficult thing to do. I literally was just on the phone with a client who was asking me about the healing nature of their work. Hmm. And I said, what about it? And they said, they actually said, don't you think coming off of where we are right now, that's what people will want? And I said, no, I think coming off where we are right now, people will want entertainment because that's what they always want. And the thing about the emotional promise of the event is it has to be true. It has to act. If you think that you can tell somebody something about what you're doing that isn't actually there and somehow market it, you know, do the Mm -hmm. advertising campaign. Yeah. That is going to be a tough road for you that it doesn't work. People then get to the thing, the wrong people go, they came looking for excitement. You gave them a haiku poem. They came looking for a haiku poem. You gave them a chainsaw, whatever that is. They don't like it. Like people don't like to be fooled. People don't like to have a promise made that isn't kept. So, That's a big part of what I do is try and convince clients to put forward a persona, a, an emotional promise that they can keep. Right. And it's an emotional promise because, frankly, I, I could name five things that your clothing line, your modern book could, could offer, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I could, we could literally do that game right now. 
But I can tell you that the most likely successes are the things that will have a little bit of emotion, a little bit of feeling to them. It's oh, certainly yeah, yeah, is yeah. true of Broadway shows. That, like you're there. It's not really a, you know, there are other arenas where there would be facts. You know, if we talked about your cameras, okay, there's, that, that's not really an emotional buy, right? There's a real factual numbers, lenses, stuff, company sure. behind it. There's a lot of facts there. A Broadway show deciding whether you'd rather go to Rent or Hamilton, which never ran next to each other, but Rent or I'm sure they will one day, um, is an emotional decision. And you're thinking about which one feels right for you. Mm -hmm. Same way you pick your music, same way you pick your movies, same way you pick pretty much all entertainment. Um, so I'm trying to get a project. I'm trying to understand what the positives are. I'm trying to make sure I understand there if there are any negatives that I've thought those through. Because mm -hmm. sometimes there are negatives that are like, uh, it's in a different language <laughs> or, or the people who are coming speak a different language, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Broadway has a now almost 70% foreign tourism rate, which doesn't mean mm -hmm. that those people all don't speak English at all, but there are people there who don't speak English, which means right. that if you have a show that can be compelling without language, like a little thing called the Lion King. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's visually compelling. The songs have been around for a very long time. So whether you speak English or not, you probably know the songs. Right. There's not so much dialogue there that you need to know versus, you know, I don't know, a play, you know, Edward Albee, you know, that, you know, something. So, you know, who's coming gets factored in or who mm -hmm. we hope to come. Um, and there is on um, Broadway, there is a kind of order of, there's a timing to it because uh, the first people that come, frankly, are they live there in New York and then the suburbs and then international tourism. And even there is a uh, there's a yearly calendar. There's a time of year when there are more people who live there. You need to come. And there's a time of year when more international tourists are there, obviously the summer mm -hmm. and the holidays. And you need to think about that, too. So you're thinking all the time about the emotional promise and then probably more you're thinking tactically about how to put that promise in front of the person who might be able and interested in going. And that's right. the media side of it. Hmm. it uh, it's interesting to me that you have this, uh, you could do your job potentially better than the play can deliver. Like you could do really good marketing and get people to come through the door. But if the, the play uh, doesn't deliver on what your marketing was able to get people through the door, then it falls flat eventually. So yeah, it's more like, I mean, that is true. You must have said no to some projects. The advertising is better than the show. It's usually more like you just can promise the wrong thing, right? Hmm. Like everything delivers something. You need to understand what that thing is you're delivering well and who might like it. You know okay. what I mean? Like it's, it's a little bit less that you have a great, great ad campaign and the show is boring. It's more like, well, what is the, th what is the beauty of the show? Where does that fall? And can I get the advertising to match that? So right. like, I think the best, so rent. That's you. So, re <laughs> so, so rent I was the customer. I had seen a lot of Broadway shows when I was younger. I grew up a couple hours, couple hours outside New York. I always found people's, I found the shows appealing and the advertising not. Hmm. And so it, when somebody said to me, Geffen said, can you go work on this thing? And what I understood was that David was selling the soundtrack, David Geffen, and he wanted to sell the soundtrack in the racks in the front of the store when we had record stores, which are the rock and roll racks, and not in the racks in the back of the store, which are the Broadway soundtrack racks. Hmm. So he wanted a rock and roll cover for this rock and roll Broadway show. And so then that's why I was sent in to be this rock and roll guy who was gonna do a rock and roll graphic that was gonna sell, and I was initially sent in to just do the album. 
And then I met the producers who are very good friends to this day. Um, my friends, uh, Jeffrey Seller and Kevin McCullum, and they were co-producers of Rent. And Jonathan Larson, who made Rent, who, who wrote Rent, had died a week before. Mm. I was the only person on the project, really in any major way, who didn't know Jonathan. So that was very unusual and very emotional. And Rent was off Broadway and blowing up. And I was brought in to make the Broadway campaign. But it was this incredibly passionate, emotional work. And so I didn't really know. Well, I think Broadway saw me as someone who didn't know what Broadway campaigns look like. I did, in fact, know because I lived in New York. I'd lived there for years, went to school in New York. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that Broadway campaigns were remarkably kind of your father's Oldsmobile, like really right. old school. And so I just started using modern, really rock and roll things. I used a rock and roll photo illustrator named Amy Gwip. We made a very kind of cool looking logo. We just kind of went at it in a contemporary way. And surprisingly, I wrote all the copy in the beginning of myself, which I'm not a copywriter, but I was the audience. Mm -hmm. So I could sort of make it different. Like I, the point of difference was that it was different. It was sort of the uncola of Broadway shows. Hmm. And that was the emotional promise was both this intensity of emotion and that it was just going to be something really new. And that was, and we didn't try and really tell the story of what happened and who these people were and why they didn't pay rent and where they lived in the East Village and what's the East Village anyways. And like, we didn't do any of that. We did like, what I came into was I want to capture the emotion of what these people are putting out on stage. Right. I want to find a way to capture that intensity and then make an ad campaign that's really intense. And mm -hmm. people were surprised by it. It's the bottom line. The show was surprising the show was extraordinary and so by the materials being um different it's sort of they dovetailed really well um you know i've done you know diary van frank i've done edward albie I've, i mean i've done many 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 different kinds of tones the most exciting ones are when there's sort of new audiences that you can find you know i did a lot of work with john leguizamo who was doing who was really in the forefront of bringing a Hispanic audience to Broadway. And that was incredibly exciting. I've done a bunch of rock and roll stuff. I've done some really um, forward edgy, you know, I did the vagina monologues. I was the first person to really make that for Broadway. And that was really a great feminist moment of driving. I mean, you know, we literally did not know if the New York Times would run the word vagina at all. <laughs> and now it seems funny, but that was yeah. not very yeah. long ago. And, that was an amazing thing to do. I've worked on some incredibly leading gay rights issues and plays, and that's been incredibly exciting to do. So, you know, they're, they're, you know, part of what I think I tried to do, although I wasn't aware of it at the time over this book and this career was to get what was perceived as sort of a kind of niche market and see if I could turn it to a more, give it a more populous voice and get more people into it. Like mm -hmm. to get, because I think that the language you use to put something out there invites people or turns them away. And so if you can use the language of contemporary culture, then more people seem like, oh, that seems like I'm up for that. Like that looks like something I would like. You right. know, I worked on Book of Mormon um, early in the days and like Matt and Trey, you know, we're, we're coming off of South Park. And that was, you know, that was kind of an amazing Now, there's thing. one Broadway show that I want to go see for sure. Should, like, that's, that's up that's my alley really as fun. far as delving into the weirdness of religion and stuff. Yeah. That, to me, is like a subject matter that I'm like, oh, yeah. So, but you actually know that. And the funny thing is, and why is for them, they don't really, that's not actually what they put out there for the show. But it's what it delivers, and it's wonderful. In yeah. That it's way. <laughs> um, so, sorry, that was a really long explanation for the emotional promise, which is just basically... You take any project, you figure out what are the most exciting things about it, mm -hmm. and then you start editing down to the things that you think you can effectively convey. Like, you know, you go like, ooh, ooh, if we were trying to get across that this entire clothing line is in neon colors, ooh, okay, that'd be really great. Or, in fact, oh, I'm only in magazines who don't run neon colors because it's a four-color process. That'd be not great. Mm -hmm. We need to find a way to make skateboard stickers. And, you know, I mean, I mean, that's, you know, there is a real pragmatic 
review of all the good things that a project has to offer and then getting the vibe right. Mm. Um, uh, the other thing I left out is competition that, uh, um, one of the great things that you can do is try and understand after you have that list of these great emotional promises is which are only yours. So if you're going to an arena where there's four other amazing things that are, have the same comedic voice that you have, well, I don't know, then you should think about either changing your arena or selling something else because you're going to be like the fifth person in the room telling the same joke. Right. So that's a big part of it too, is just trying to say, okay, so, all right, people come to you and say, I have this thing. And I say, okay, what's the thing everybody around you is doing? Like, what? who are your competitors? What's their voice? What's their personality? And what can you truly be that's genuinely you that's not the same as everybody else? Right. So I really learned that on Broadway because, I mean, it's like 40 theaters in a tiny geographic area. And you really need to think about it. I mean, if you if you go make a green ad campaign, well, then like Wicked is green and like you're an idiot because mm. like they own green and you can't get near it. And so you shouldn't get near it because that's what they do and they do it really well. So um, that's, you know, that's a thing to always be thinking about is what's your emotional promise. There are always many, it's never one. And then you edit that down to, well, what's just, what's really yours that you think you can say well, and that none of your competitors are doing so well with. And then, then you know what you're supposed to do. And then once everybody in the room agrees, okay, great. That's the thing we're going to do. Then to me, the really fun part starts, which is to figure out creatively how you can do that. And you're mm. always using that decision to evaluate. You make some cool looking thing and then you go, okay, is this saying that? Or if we wanted to say rustic artisanal uh, down home Maine, um, for lack of anything else I can think of. Well, then <laughs> here's all, here's, we tried this way. We tried that way. We looked at that way. We got this song over here. We got these colors over here. Um, which of these is doing that really well? Right. Um, and then, and then you have your answer of your project. So a, uh, kind of a technical question to a degree, but how many times would you watch these plays before you were able to really uh distill them down and feel that but what's funny about your question is that you assume that i've ever been able to watch them because you really you're working on it before it's been made okay so sometimes you only have a script mm -hmm. and that's harder than being able to see it 100 percent. right more times you've seen a reading and a reading is you know in a room like this in, in dressed like this and right. people are singing and talking but and you can see on the wall a little drawing of this is what the set will be, mm -hmm. or these are what the costumes will be, but you don't have them yet. Um, and then every now and then, and it's really pretty rare that you get to see the full everything and then go make what you're making. So that's another reason and a wonderful reason why you kind of enjoy the collaborative process because I've become friends with the set designers. I've right. become friends with the costume designers we all need to talk to each other about where it's going. Right. And they're often on a project before me. So they've had really long conversations about, and there's some of them, one in particular, David Rockwell, who's an amazing set designer, has whole rooms of reference before he starts. I mean, a room. And the walls are just covered with reference. Hmm. And so if you can get to his office and get let in that room, which he's always been gracious enough to do, then there's a world of research that he's already done about hmm. the life of what your show is. And it's just, you know, it's explosively helpful. So where one ad agency might work with BMW, they say, all right, here's the finished product, digest it, create uh, creative content and media around this. You come in in the way you did things, you came in during the creation process to a large degree of that show. And you're much more of a partner in, uh, and anybody who's doing that work on Broadway at least is, and I, it went well, I was good at it. 
I had the right skill set to do it. So I got to do more of it. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think if I sort of didn't pay attention to what they were doing or ignored the voices that they were putting out there and my work and said, you know, whatever, then I wouldn't have been allowed back in. I mean, it is a very tough room to get in metaphorically Mm -hmm. and it takes a long time to get people to trust you. And then once they do, you're a part of what they do. And, um, you know, and, and then you sort of build trust over the years, having worked with people sometimes multiple times. And so right. we've all been there before together. So yeah, it I've, it's more collaborative. I've experienced a degree of what you're saying by having my background be in architecture, having a master's degree in architecture and working as an architect and then going into the room to say, I can portray your architecture through photography. I, I speak the language and, you know, so that, that works now to me, you learned your way in, honestly, you're not just taking a picture. You can think about, I mean, I can imagine that being very quickly, um, enabling, empowering all the good words. Yeah. The, an interesting, uh, concept that I'm seeing with you working first on rent, you were the audience for that. So you, at the time, lacked experience compared to looking at this book i mean rent was kind of a starting point for you to to a large degree first broadway show and i did rent and chicago both the first year wow broadway shows i was incredibly lucky i was in i was new and rent succeed i mean look i could have done rent and it failed and i would never have been given another project so Mm. It's not just that I did a good job of rent and I did. Right. Um, it also blew up and made, it was very successful. It was also incredible. So other good. people thought, oh, a kid, maybe he can do a thing. And I was right. pretty young. And, um, and then um, at the same, that was 97. And um, so Chicago asked me if I would look at that. Um, and, and then Chicago did really well and does do really well still now, Mm -hmm. um, which is amazing. It's gone all this time. And um, so once those two did well financially, it really kind of validated my business. Right. But still there was lots and lots of, you know, there are other people who did what I did and competition and ad agencies and, you know, and then the rest is 25 years later. Now in, in my wanderings of, uh, questioning philosophy, blah, blah, blah. I've run into people, uh, psychologists and philosophers that have told me that you understand truth before you can articulate it. You'll experience truth and you'll understand it before you can regurgitate and articulate it. You're articulating now your process, but you went into rent, not being able maybe to articulate all the things that you can now But through that process, you realized, oh, I'm the audience, so I can understand this. So after that, I imagine you uh, had enough self-reflection to say, this this spoke to me. I was the audience. Now, how do I apply that to any play where I might not essentially be the exact audience like I was for Rent, but now I can take what I've learned through experience that's become a truth and then translate that into success each time, like you're saying. That's yeah. I have more of a logic to it now. I certainly yeah. didn't have any logic to it then. Right. And rent was just me doing me. But then, actually, the third thing we did was Diary of Anne Frank, mm-hmm. and I was really conscious of how it was a completely different vibe, a completely different tone than what people, we were sort of getting known as the rock and roll people, even though Chicago is a rock and roll. I think the campaign was viewed that way. Yeah. It's, and it's probably brash. the Chicago campaign is the one that's most lauded. Uh, it's just the one that people like. And I think it's the one that people like the most because it matches the show really well. Like, cause that's ultimately a great success. If you can, if you can really mirror what's happening on stage emotionally out, then the people who are, well, certainly the people who have made the show, they're happy. And I think it's shown itself to be then the customers who go, they're happy because the promise you made to them is mm. then fulfilled. Everything's so cohesive. Then, so then working on Diary of Anne Frank was like, okay, this is a completely different 
vibe in every way. Like I need to get out of my own, you know, MTV is not applicable here, you know, so I need to use the process, but not the, um, not the instinct in a way. Like, it, mm. you know, you, you, you can't just work on your own vibe. You know I mean? I didn't, I'm not Jewish. I didn't have that background. You have to understand what you're looking at. And certainly we're all more aware of that now, certainly in terms of like a cultural breadth, right? You have mm -hmm. to know what you don't know. You have to know what you should find out or be listening really closely to when you're getting to an arena that isn't your own um, or, or you're selling to an audience that isn't your own. You know, who are they? What are they interested in? What do they want? What do they not want? So um, it's always a little bit of instinct and it's always like, I've heard a lot of actors talk about, you know, villains and you have to find the thing to love. So for me, when you get to see these shows or hear these shows, you have to find the vibe, right? I mean, you have to find the thing that you groove on and then work with that. Like, it's really, it's not so intellectual. I mean, you're really saying, oh, I love that. Oh, what mm -hmm. can we do with that? I love that character. Or I love that song or I love the look or I love the, the, it's very hard for me. And I have worked on things where I did not like the visual look of them. Mm -hmm. And that's hard for me being such a visual person. Right. So then I have to sort of find another way, you know, either to get into the visual world of what I wish it was, or, um, you know, Hamilton, one of the things that we did, Hamilton was unusual in the, it's unusual in every way, but Hamilton I had already worked with Lynn Manuel Miranda on In the Heights. And it's Jeffrey, the same person who produced Rent and Avenue Q and many other things produced Hamilton. So he and I have worked together my whole career and almost his whole career. And in fact, we're working together now on another project. So uh, it's, it's one of the great relationships. But um, one of the first things that we did was we, we did one of those rooms filled with reference and brought Lynn in and said, before we made anything, and said, okay, take down everything you hate. But that was really different because lots of times you're working with people who are not so adept at articulating truth, right? You make, you can feel it as to your quote, mm -hmm. but you don't, it's not very easy to get on the phone and say, look, you know, what it can't be is this. And what it can't, like people, oftentimes clients are sort of like, they don't know how to get that into words, right? They just can look at it and say, I'll know when I see it. Which right. is awful right. when someone says to you because you're just thinking, okay. But Lynn, as everybody knows now, is incredibly articulate. Mm -hmm. And so he was able to really quickly go through and say, no, 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 no. no. And we just, we just pulled down, pulled down, pulled down, and we're left with like, Hmm. probably seven things like we were left with a very small amount of things out of hundreds of images and one of the most interesting things that happened was we got into the gold conversation because gold was appropriate for the american revolution and hip-hop mm -hmm. and it was literally like a venn diagram that you could do okay we could do hmm. gold what could we do with gold what could gold be because gold is both like cannons and medals and Big E and Tupac. And that right. was that was one of the hooks in, one of the ways in. And um, I really didn't want to make a revolutionary war thing. Like I knew that there were a certain amount of people who were into that and read David McCullough books and really would be fascinated to hear Alexander right. Hamilton's story. But I thought it was a pretty small window uh -huh. i also was worried it was really male i know that seems odd but like most of the people who buy broadway tickets are women not most people who go but most of the people right. who buy right so if you have a project that doesn't speak to women that's you're gonna have a hard time hmm. so that may or may not have been true and obviously the final show is spectacular speaks to women spectacularly and in fact you know it ends on um, really on Hamilton, you know, it goes all the way to have the great grace. Well, I, I don't want to give away the ending of Hamilton, do I? But it, it speaks to the women in Hamilton's life incredibly well. And mm. um, so, but anyways, from the beginning, I didn't really want to make 
that Revolutionary War graphic. We were trying to make something really kind of populist. And okay. I didn't want Lynn to say it's hip hop history, which he would say. And I was trying to get him to not say it because right. I thought, well, we'll just split the audience. You're either into hip hop or history, but this way, putting those two together, everybody who likes both of them is going to be like, mm, I don't know. So, right. you know, it was not such an easy thing to put in front of people and go, of course, here we go. A hip hop contemporary take on the life of Alexander Hamilton it was like, you know, what? You know, that's <laughs> yeah, so no, I remember hard. hearing about it for the first time. And I was like, for some reason, I put myself when I when I see I used to own a small van from Japan <laughs> and the I name of it going. was the Master Ace Surf. So somewhere in a boardroom in Something. Japan, someone stood up and said, let's name it the Master, the Master Ace, Ace Surf. Surf. And I, it's just like, how did they not get laughed out of the boardroom? Did it have surf qualities since I know that you surf? Like, it, it like was a, a van that you could fit a surfboard in, but it it was just a van. It was just right. you know it didn't really have a special no. surf. No, there was no special. I mean, it had a glass roof and stuff, but that's the sky. That's not you know, I. But it, it was just you know it, to me like to be in that conversation. I never would have pitched that you know, and for me to think to be in the pitch for Hamilton, like no, no, it's. Alexander Hamilton, but hip hop. And it's like, no, next, please. Like right. that could never fly. I mean, luckily, and it's crazy huge. I mean, it's so it's successful. Huge. You know, like I'm obviously it's not a good. It's the brand that Peter's ever had. Oh, yeah. It, uh, eventually. It, and you can play with that some different ways. But yeah. you know, at this point, Lion King is the largest entertainment property. Lion King, the musical. Wow. The musical is the most successful financial entertainment property in any medium, any wow. medium, huh. film, video, um, any medium. Wow. Because they keep going for so long. And right. They, so, you know, I've lived through a lot of time where people made the Broadway thing sort of like, that's cute. Like, that's cute, kid. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I've had a lot of that. And it's like, you know, these are huge brands. Oh, they are now. Um, yeah. They go everywhere all over the world, and that's super exciting. So the combination of their ability to be really part of the public culture and then working on them in a really kind of artisanal way. I mean, literally, I bet it's not unlike, you know, putting up a new restaurant in Portland. You know, like it's a small group of investors. There's a name. There's a there's a stick. There's a tryout. There's a... There are problems with the unions. There are, you know, I mean, there's casting in a way, you know, or this chef, that person, that, you know. And, you know, so the remarkable thing about that is that such a big, something that could turn out to be a big brand could be made in such a small room mm. that, you know, I, I don't understand cars because you brought cars up. Like, I think the, the, the emotional range of car design is so narrow um, of new car design. Like, obviously, if you want to collect cars, that's where you, you start to find really interesting things, right? Like right. you're a surf fan. But the new cars that get made, I, they basically all look like each other as far oh, as yeah. I'm concerned. Yeah. Yeah, no. And if you actually were thinking about all the ways, all the different kinds of people in the world and the things they wish, like the surf fan, okay, think what you could make, what it could be, what it could look like, what it could do. The, you know, for that person. It's just obvious that people don't build cars that way because there's only this many surfers. There's only this. So we've got to, yeah. we've got to broaden. And it's so, an extremely expensive thing to produce and right. not to do it on and mass so quantity you can't and just profit margin. Decide that you, that, you know, you can put the stripes on the car any way you want, just come to the factory. Right. Mm -hmm. But you can make a Hamilton in a room this size. I mean, you really, right. you can, and you It just do. takes some spark of genius and then people to recognize that and fund it. It does, it takes all that. But I'm just saying it is amazing to me, you and I cannot get in the boardroom of right. GM. And I don't know what it takes to become a guy who can design a car and be a, you know, someone who can really break out, but somehow I got in the boardroom of Broadway and became trusted 
and then was able to innovate because there were people who were interested. And there were many people, and there are many people right now, who are very interested in those innovations because mm -hmm. they've been successful. And there are, tis, there are people who are artists, and they want to work in that way as artists. And that's really exciting to work with other artists and try and match your artistry with theirs. Right. Yeah, that's a... Whenever I get onto the subject of architectural photography, it's an interesting thing because I'm overlaying my creativity over someone else's creativity. Yeah. Their, their project is done. Now I have to come in. I, I kind of say that if you look at an architectural photograph and you think about the photograph, you failed. If I look at a photograph and say that's a great photograph, I haven't done my job well if someone else mm -hmm. looks at it. But if they look at it and they say, holy cow, that architecture then I've done my job well. So in architectural photography specifically is a, a large degree of finding the essence of a project and getting out of the way, not trying to do a bunch of running around and making noise. And Yeah, but I would say it ends up in the middle because you're in it. Yeah, it's yeah, you're in there. First, but you're like people aren't realizing how much you're in it. And yeah. that's what they... That's the magic. That's the magic, right? Yeah. Is that yeah. that's true of my stuff too, is hopefully you're in it, but it isn't showing off you it's showing right. off right it. yeah and i think photographers specifically um there, there's a large degree of less is more in my opinion especially in architectural photography because there's a lot of uh a lot of technician that will come out in people and well if i don't do more i'm not justifying what i'm charging and and it's kind of like yeah. when you work with All stylists right, I'll buy that it depends. I mean, Peter Beard just passed away a couple of days ago. Peter Beard was like a more is more photographer. Mm -hmm. And he was literally like half of his photograph was the life he was living that was in the photo. Right. With the lions and the crit. So like I can love less is more photography. I can love more is more. Right. It all depends on. the, And I feel the same way in my stuff. Rarely do I get to do less. But sometimes I'm really going more and people are like, okay, like that's enough with you and the more. Right. But, you know, I don't know. I like, that's probably a reason also I've been successful in the Broadway thing is because it's a good arena for. It's a very emotional it's arena, an emotional right? Arena. It's sort of a loud, bright arena. I mean, literally yeah. you have to make a graphic for Times Square. I mean, we would make these graphics and then take pictures at Times Square and Photoshop them in and see how they were going to look. Mm -hmm. Because in fact, that's where they were going to end up. And it's really hard to make a graphic show up in Times Square. I mean, it is really hard. Like yeah. there's so much visual clutter that you, you need to be at, you know, to take from Spinal Tap, like you got to be at 11 <laughs> to really get the thing to show up. Right. And I, over time you get better at knowing that and what will show up or you try and find it. You know, I have a great designer who worked for me who once said, you know, sometimes you can shout by whispering. And I was like, right. Ooh, so Ooh. Book of Mormon seems like it's kind of doing that. It's, it Book seems like a very a minimalist other gig. And it was done ultimately by a, by an agency on the West coast called BLT. That's very, very talented. My role in it. And it's not in my book because I only played a small role in it is I was able to take a whole bunch of designs that were done that different people liked and shove them together. And so um, there was a doorbell and there were Mormons and there was, so I kind of did a little bit of a, and then I did the photo. Well, I, you're not really asking me that, but I did the photo shoot for Book of Mormon and then I didn't work on the show anymore. Mm -hmm. But that has a lot to do with, it's lead producer's love of it's lead producer's a man named Scott Rudin and um, actually both sides, Scott Rudin and a woman named Anne Garofino. And they, he loves the history of theater. Um, he's also a really prominent movie producer, but he loves the history of theater. And he had said to me that he wanted a Michael Kidd feel. Now, that's a real Broadway conversation with Michael Kidd was a choreographer uh, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, the movie, there's a kind of athleticism to mm -hmm. Michael Kidd choreography. And so the Jumping Mormons actually <laughs> comes out of a sort of Seven Brides for Seven Brothers history of musical theater. Um, 
and but I, I told you before that uh, Edward Albee, I once showed him a design for Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and it was a hand with a tumbler glass and ice in it, and the words "Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf" was in the ice. And he said he rejected it and said to me, "My play is not about drinking," which. I started to argue and then I was like, oh, he was a very crafty guy. And I thought, yeah, you're going to argue with Edward Albee about what his play is about. Like, you need to shut up. And so I did. <laughs> and we did a different design. But, you know, oftentimes where things come from are big surprises. You know, you don't really know. The stories behind things, which is a lot in the book, always oh, fascinating. Like the turns things take. Yeah. The personalities involved, people. Sometimes it's really logical, and sometimes it's just, it just kind of happens, and it takes mm -hmm. off, and someone really likes the blue, and then it's blue, and then you know, it's, right, it's, right. It's as much like that, but I, you know, hopefully you're prepared for it. You know, some of it is just hanging around a while, you know, like kind of oh, yeah. hanging in. You know, like I can make that. T I assume in your world, seeing something. Um. And waiting for the light to be what you want it to be, or even choosing that this is the day where the cloud covers what I want or isn't there, or whatever, for this project. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to put the energy in to do that. You know, you've got to be willing to put the, you know, put the time in to know the day you want and the time you want and go back five times because you didn't get it before because... <laughs> Done that. The wind was blowing and the leaves were in your lens. You know, I mean, like that's it's that's that's not unlike, I mean, that's true of any process, right? You right. Just, some it's rarely well, here it is. Here's the perfection in one take. It's you right. know, I mean, yeah, you gotta like you gotta make a lot of stuff to get down to some right stuff, and hopefully you can get the right stuff. I mean, the worst part is when the process just chips all the corners off of your nice crisp square and now you have like a lump yeah kind uh, of a design by committee to yeah, a large degree and we all have that and i have that and i still have that i'm in a better position now to kind of push away from that yep but it isn't easy i've got a i was on a 45 person meeting last week that became an eight person meeting and then an eight this afternoon and another eight tomorrow for <laughs> um for broadway for the yep. whole an ad campaign for Broadway's return, mm -hmm. which isn't obviously done yet in May. It'll be interesting to see if when this runs in July, if we will have that ad campaign yet or not. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so you had your opportunity with Rent. You knocked it out of the park. Um, you. you specifically had some qualities. So like take, put Broadway it, like it doesn't exist. What were the qualities about you that like in in have you had any self-reflection and realize like here's my ability and this is why I'm I'm good in what you what you've done? I have a good amount of energy and that helps, right? To to it's be huge. meaning like to be like I'm not a quiet sober person i'm more of a playful person yeah so that helps um i can speak across artistic temperament and market realities like mm -hmm. i can do both those things and i'm not afraid of either one of those things and once people know i had an intern who's now a very prominent designer and he said to me you know he was he was just out of being my intern and he said, you know, when you talk art to people, he didn't mean me, he meant anyone, but it might as well have been me. When you talk art to people, you terrify them because they just think, oh, here comes that art thing. And I don't understand that art thing. And now I don't understand you. And you're going to talk to me in this language. I don't know. It makes me feel like I'm an idiot. All that same things that people bring sometimes to going to a museum, right? This just makes me feel stupid. I could do this at home. So I really try not, I was just on a phone call the other day where somebody was pitching something and they were really getting, they were, they were explaining the reasons why a thing was good in terms of artistry. You know, look at the scale, look at the, you know, look at the tonality, look at the, you know, contrast and the thing. I'm like, okay, yeah, that doesn't work. I mean, people want to know, that's my job to do that part well, but they want to know how it's going to solve their problem. 
So I'm good at saying, okay, first let's all agree what the problem is. And that really helps to learn that because if everybody's in agreeing, if you can get everyone to agree up front what the problem is we're trying to solve, then you all have agreed on what is going to be the parameters for success. Mm. And so then when you come back with the work, you can say, I think this solves your problem this way. Right. Luckily, I'm in an arena where the problem to be solved can be an emotional one. So if we, you have some hysterically funny show and you say, I, you know, the problem to be solved is that I want a funny ad campaign. Okay. So we've all decided now that success is, you know, make me laugh. It should be funny. Right. Great. Let's do that. Let's, and then we just have different, at least we're all on the same page as to what we're trying to solve. Right. So I'm good at combining the strategic and the artistic. Uh, and I'm now really good at seeing where it can go in my head before it goes there with other people's work. So there's mm. a lot of what I, you know, ultimately I sold the ad agency, uh, the big ad agency that we're t- talking about called Spotco, uh, five, six, seven years ago, something like that. And now I have a small design studio here in Portland, Maine, and I work on a project at a time, literally a, a designer and myself. Um, but when we, when I saw the ad agency, there were 120 people. So you obviously have to get good at communicating what you'd like to see happen to other people because you're not making it all yourself by any means. Right. And then I realized really a while ago that like, if you just hire the best people, they just make you look like a genius. I mean, right. like you literally over and over again, I'm just amazed that people will hire like the sort of best person. And I'm like, no, no, no. The best person who does this is this. I told you that Christy Macklin told me to hire Trent Bell. Like this is the person <laughs> that should photograph your house. That, and, and people are like, well, I don't know if he'll, and I'm like, well, who knows? Maybe he will do it. Maybe particularly in my arena, you could often go to someone and say, okay, you may have done everything, but you have never done a Broadway show. So let's let's work on one together. And then the, urge, the person's a genius and they do genius things and everything about it's genius. So I'm good at art direction, which is really, I'm good at seeing how a thing might get better and being able to articulate that to people and say, let's try this, let's make it mm. blue, let's turn it upside down, let's get, some of in Japan, let's, you know, I'm good at having ideas for how to puzzle solve how the thing would get better. So, so those, you would have a pretty critically working mind then. You approach things critically, pull them yeah, apart, think it's about a them. More instinctual, but yeah, I guess so. I guess so. I'm really thinking, like, if someone says you can do anything you want, just no parameters at all, I don't find that good. Like, oh, I really love it when someone's right there says, with you. <laughs> Here's the box. Here's yeah. all the problems. Yeah. Yeah. You know, thread the needle. And well, then I'm like, oh, I know what'll thread the needle. Yeah. yeah. We're gonna and I love that. Like yeah. I can do that pretty fast. The, the, the needle. The thing that I had a problem with in architecture school was that they'd give you just these very, very limitless, like, yeah, there's no budget and just do, you know. And I I was always drawn to projects that had I was always drawn to uh, looking into projects that had been completed that had really crazy limitations, either like crazy small lot and what they did with it or crazy small budget. How creative did they get as far as like pillaging stuff from a dump, but still made something beautiful? You know, I thought limitations really uh, made beauty through that creativity of how they solved that. And I always thought that was Really like, like okay, you and I were talking about setting this up, and it was like, okay, we're gonna have to be this far away from each other. So, like, maybe there's something in that. Maybe right. this setup is interesting. Maybe uh, well, this morning in my head, I was still thinking like, I don't know if I like his idea of this this over the shoulder thing. I think it would be better still to do exactly like I've always done. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, you know what, this guy art directed to an nth degree. No, I sh- I, I need to kind of try his idea. Like. I you can't know tell what it looks like, but. uh you know, there could have been another way. We could have been yeah. apart this way and have a huge thing of flowers in between and that would have been funny. Or, right. you know, like with with the parameters, I don't know, there's always so many opportunities. Like, okay, because this is this way and we have to be eight feet apart, 
what does that mean about everything? You know, like right. we could have, you know, if we did this every day for a week, like then it'd be like, well, what color are you wearing and I'm wearing? And then we'll, we'll have some fun with that. And then right. I'll flip over there and then we'll put it on a rotating thing and that'll be cool. We'll slowly turn. Right. And then at one point we'll be across from each other this way. And then we'll be this way. Then at one point you'll eclipse me and I'll only see the back of your head. And right. you know what I mean? Like I love any parameter I can like go in and be like, okay, there's an asset within this parameter. Mm -hmm. um, that Chicago actually came out of um, a, a big restriction. And then it's, it's sort of what made it great. But there was a minimalism to the way they did the show mm -hmm. that was suddenly like, oh, we'll do it like that. We'll do it like that. We'll do it like, we'll do it in black and white photography. Right. And at the time it was like, wait, wait, what? You're going to do... First of all, when I did Rent... It was, I was told very clearly, why are you using photographs? Like, why are you using photographs? Mm -hmm. Like all the logos were like phantom mask at the time. Right. Which I really admire and I'm not very good at making. Um, and then now you're going to use the photograph, but it was contemporary and it was rock and roll and it was my way of working. And so then that happened. And now that's almost like, now I wish that we could get away from using them because just everything is a photograph now and it's sort of becoming a movie poster. Mm -hmm. Um, but then, um, at the, after that people said to me, well, why are you photographing them? They're not famous because the only reason you would have a photograph. And so then, but then that was all color and they all got famous and I wasn't trying to show that they were famous anyways. And then, um, we did Chicago the same year in black and white and people were like, like, do you not have a color set? Like, black and white. Like, we're going to do a musical in black and white. But it really suited the minimalism of the show. It sort of went right with it. So, you know, to this day, I mean, there are, you know, it's always, it's got to be black and white for that one brand. It was sort of a, a color that we could own, like, green for Wicked. Right. So right now, if you go and make a black and white thing, then, like, someone's going to tell you, for Broadway, they're going to say, I don't know. Looks like right. Chicago. Right. <laughs> so, uh, I like the limitations a lot and that, um, so that's, that's going well. And then I've been extremely lucky because if those two shows didn't succeed, I wouldn't have gotten the other ones. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think I came along at a time when, um, there were more people looking to get some, get Broadway to be in a more contemporary space. As I said, like that arc, kind of goes from rent to Hamilton really get you know, Broadway becomes more and more a part of the contemporary entertainment scene over the last 30 years. Right. And hopefully I was a part of that and there were, it was happening and I came in as a contemporary entertainment guy with experience in other entertainment genres. So I had a good skill set for what wanted to happen. Right. It wasn't right. that logical, but that's looking back. I can see. Sure. That. Sure. Um, What's the advice that you would give to the young Drew Hodges? To me or to any student? You. Uh, hmm. um, find out whose advice works for you. I have three mentors I can easily name. This Paul Cher, who's a famous, famous graphic designer, who was an amazing mentor and my senior thesis teacher and a friend to this day, uh, Jeffrey Seller, who produced Rent and Hamilton, all those. Um, and now uh, I would say Jessica Tomlinson at Mecca is my mentor that she's, all those people are people who, they're people whose advice for me works for me, right? Everyone gives advice. Mm. Everyone says, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't move to Maine. You should move to Maine. You shouldn't get a boat. You should get a boat. This kind of boat you should get. This should get a boat. Definitely should Definitely get a boat. should get a boat, but not that kind of boat. Not <laughs> a Grady. Get a Ellis. Not a... So everybody has advice. All right. The hard part is to find people who, for whatever reason, uh, and I think the reasons differ. Some people are incredibly empathetic, but some people are just a little more like you that their advice works well for you. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's really, really helpful is to know whose advice really works for you 
And thus, when you really are in a moment that you need somebody to talk to, you go to the right somebody and mm. say, what do you think? What do you think? I can name 10 conversations with those three people where they were able to say, yeah, at one point, everybody gave me, at one point with Jeffrey, I was, we were, um, we had just lost Wicked as an account, right? We were, Wicked was going to be a big show. No, I mean, no one knew it was going to be this show, but it was going to be a very big show. And we were up against a, an agency that had been around, still around, that had been around for a long time before us. So the blue chip agency, we were kind of Apple to their IBM in terms of tone. And we were pitching and getting our friends to write letters to Universal Studios. And it was in the fairly early days of movie studios being involved in Broadway. And we went back and forth, back and forth. And then we lost it. And I was told by someone involved with the show, um, who's a pretty prominent person now, so we're not going to say their name, but I was told by someone that, in fact, they really liked our work and they really liked their work. But their corporate, the other agency's corporate background was a much better fit for the studio. That mm -hmm. we were a little young and a little, you know, indie for who they were. And I was so mad. I was so mad. And our lease was coming up. And so I decided that I wanted to build a new, our office we used to call Pee Wee's Playhouse. It was like this crazy, wacky rabbit worn and we had taken on space after space after space and just opened up a little further. So literally by, in, by the end, you to get to one end from the other, you had to like run through this maze. Sure. So we started looking at all these different spaces and um, I mean, only the biggest one, the, the real sick guy liked and my CFO did not want me to see. They had cut it down to five before I saw it, which again, pick really smart people. And they, you know, I didn't see 50. I saw five. I think I actually saw four. And the last one, which I saw was explosively great. It was this huge, you know, atrium two-story old bank on 38th Street. And it had its private, it had private entrance. It was just like, it could be amazing, but it was kind of a mess. And it was going to take a lot of money to renovate it. And I went to everybody and my CFO said, who's the greatest, he said, yeah, no, 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 we're not doing this. We're not doing this. And other people just said, yeah, yeah, not doing this, not doing this. And then I went uh, to Jeffrey and I said, here's what just happened to me. I just lost this huge show. And he said to me, okay. And I knew where the other agency was, the building they were in. And he said, so Jeffrey Katzenberg will just make somebody up, um, which is, then Jeffrey Katzenberg, this actually happened later, but Jeffrey Katzenberg, he said, he's going to go up their elevator and come down it. And then he's going to go over and come up this elevator, which happened to be in a building that he knew well. That was our best, most reasonable choice. And he said, yeah, you've lost already. And so hmm. we built out the new office. We spent we spent a million dollars building out the new office. And, and it worked. And, and our business just exploded because it was the right space and it was exciting and it was fun and it was a great, and it was, it was just a joy to work on. And everybody just laughed and we had a ball and, and the clients would come in. And then literally about a year and a half later, Jeffrey Katzenberg came to town to see who was going to do Shrek and went to everybody's office. And then he came to ours and he said, this one feels really right to me and picked us. And then hmm. we got it. So like that, you know, so having, you know, any number of people, I bet 15 people told me, no, 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 no. Yeah, that's fine. That building's fine and you should go there. So having the right person to ask a question of is, can be really key in key moments. And I just knew that his answer was the right answer for me. So playing off of that, what have you, uh, what's the most significant thing you've learned uh, from a critic? that that you've thought you were right and then they were critical of it and you're like wow you know actually basically it's because you thought you were right and then i mean that's the most it's not the exact reason why or not it's that it's very easy to fall in love with your own thing and yep. not get it and not have any and lose perspective on why it is how it is or how someone else is going to probably gaining the vision of saying okay this is how this group of people is going to view this thing. Have I looked at it? You know, have I turned it around and looked at the back and looked at the front and decided? And if they say, I think it looks too much like 
you know, the big blue marble or whatever, or a kid's show or a shark in the water or, you know, because people always love to say something that it looks like. And then everyone goes, well, you know, can't use that now. It looks like an alligator. So you have to be ready for that. You have to be ready for that ahead of time because people have different perspectives on what they like. And it isn't always about everybody. You know, it's often about uh, figuring out who in the room is gonna, who really has the decision and think about what they want because right. group decisions are rarely group decisions. They're led by a few key people. Right. So thinking about who that's going to be. Hmm. I do know someone who doesn't take jobs unless they know that they're going to be connected to the decider. I, I've never hmm. been quite that strict, but I think it's a pretty good policy. Hmm. Uh, now, we had spoken about this a little bit when you were here before, but uh, the creative industry and money and how all that works. Um, but I said, I hate that people don't talk about money because they, yeah. they make it seem like it's something to be afraid of. Yeah. Like what, what's your advice on that from your perspective now? And, and I mean, you've obviously had to interact with relationships and how money affects them and how money tells you you're valued and, and all that as well. And, um, and, and also it's interesting to me, uh, creativity to me comes from your life experience and, uh, to put a, uh, a, a monetary value on your life experience, pulling from that, it gets weird. Like, how do you, what do you see from your perspective? A couple of specific things. Um, when I'm dealing with students all the time, I say, ask, ask me about money because I find that they want to know how else will they know how to price anything, mm. or to handle anything. But I feel like they need to be invited because somehow it's been said that that's a rude subject, right? You mm -hmm. can ask someone how much money they make at a job. It is rude. I get it. But, um, but still they need to understand how money works. Um, I, love phases. I love doing any project and building them out in phases with money so that everybody gets really calm that like, should this not go well, we can always stop here. We can always stop here. Mm -hmm. Should this delay forever? Well, then at least I can get paid as we go something for cash flow that, um, you know, one big number at the end is not great for either party. I think then they right. get really nervous. Um, and mainly, it's not personal that I try. There is a way to talk to people about money that's honest and sincere and isn't emotional. That's just like, well, this is what, obviously, giving a number to someone in an arena where you have no idea what other people charge is a dangerous place to be. Yeah. Uh, both ways. You could come in way over. You could come in way under. You don't know. So it's great to do your research and try and find out about where it is. Although, if anything, I, I do see people undersell, but I do see a lot of overselling too, where people imagine that because, you know, they're amazing, that they should get $25,000 for this logo when in fact the other people at that arena are getting four. So like, that's, mm -hmm. you got to know that part. But um, I like phases. And I may, but the worst is I see people avoid money. They avoid the discussion of it. Mm -hmm. And then later it's so much worse. Like yeah. when you're trying, we never really talked about what I was going to charge for this, but I would like, Ooh, that's that. Don't do that. Like right. don't, if you're uncomfortable with money, probably the best advice I could give is get someone else to do the money part for you. If you're an artist, find a freelancer mm -hmm. who, uh, writes up estimates for people and are, you know, like a two day week bookkeeper who works for this agency, that agency and that agency and mm -hmm. have them write your estimates. And I guarantee you, you'll make more money because it's not personal to them. They're right. aware of what the market will bear and they're going to put out a number. And, you know, it's rare that you put out a number and someone just walks away because the number wasn't quite right. You have to be way off for someone. I've done to that. Just walk away. <laughs> We, we, we've all done it, yeah. but in general, if you're a little high or even a third high, someone will tell you and you'll have an opportunity to decide if you want to come down or not. Mm -hmm. So the worst mistake you can make is not discussing money. Right. 
the easiest way for a younger person to get better about money is to let someone else do it. Because mm. when you're making it, you undervalue yourself almost always. Imposter just, syndrome to a degree. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's built in that everybody gets a little worried. So better to have somebody else um, put it together. Mm. Uh, and that's, uh, um, yeah, those are the, I mean, really, my big message about money is, I don't know why we never talk about money. Like that it's like somehow because we're in the arts, we think that it's a it's a verboten subject and it's it's absurd. Everybody has to eat, everybody has to be and and frankly clarity really makes money go fine, right? Being clear on a piece of paper or what saying this is what I'll charge and this is what you'll get. Mm -hmm. And this is when you'll get it and being and living up to your expectations is how money goes fine. When no right. one's surprised, everybody says great. And when people are surprised, it's always bad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I didn't think this would go on this long. I didn't think you'd ask me for 19 comps. Well, right. then write in how many you do think is going to be asked for so that right. you have a way. Basically, both sides just need the ability to renegotiate a little bit. I think right. that's what makes most people comfortable is if they can say, okay, uh, uh what if this just doesn't go great um and sort of and make sure everybody knows ahead of time okay we're about to do we're about to do this thing this thing is about to happen and then you're gonna owe this we're we're good mm -hmm. you you're aware everybody that signed off you got your money you got your investment money you got whatever you needed because right um i've been in the position a lot of owing money of being this the sub you know, having a lot of people work for me and I owe them money and then I have to get paid. Right. You know, a right. lot of Broadway ad agencies have gone out for uh, going belly up for bankruptcy mm -hmm. because the New York Times is getting paid. If you if you take an yeah. ad in the New York Times and you don't pay them, you will never take another one again. Right. Because they because <laughs> they need to to protect themselves as well. They should. Yeah. And so if your show goes out on you, you owe the hundred thousand dollars and I've had it happen. So you've got to be prepared for that and you've got to have some understanding with the other side and still it happens. It's a hard thing for a creative, especially starting out to put a value on what they do because you have this conflict of interest kind of where it's like you enjoy what you're doing. So it automatically you think, well, I, I shouldn't have to get paid to do things I enjoy. There's a little bit There's of that apology. weirdness. I have a good trick. A good trick is I tell people to do this. Take out a pencil, piece of paper, and start writing down five hundred dollar increments. And start wherever you. It doesn't matter. You'll know where to start. You can start at zero. You can get there a little faster than that. Start at start at a thousand. Start at five thousand. Whatever the project is, mm -hmm. and just go up in five hundred dollar increments or a thousand, depending how big the project is. Mm -hmm. Then walk away, come back with a pencil, and start crossing off from the top and the bottom. You will know. Way too little, way too much, right. way too little, way too much. And you will, in 30 seconds, end up with about three prices. It's amazing how well it works. Hmm. And then you just look at the three and go, yeah, yeah, okay, that one. I'm feeling like I'm going to go high. I'm going to go. But it's interesting. If you write them down, it's much easier to do than it's in your head. And eliminating what you know is wrong is much easier than guessing what's right. And hmm. then... And right. you can really, when I'm unsure what to charge, I still do that. I still do it. I had to do it yesterday. Well, you just said something interesting there. Eliminating what you know is wrong is easier than deciding what's right. I have clients do it a lot too. Instead of telling me when they have like 10, 10, 10 looks and they mm -hmm. go, geez, hopefully they go, geez, this is, there's so much great stuff here. I don't know what to say. Right. I always say, okay. Let's start by getting rid of what you don't like because they're careful and they're, they think you're precious, which is a bad thing to put out. <laughs> Not, you know, don't be precious. And they want to know you're working with them. And I know some of them they don't like. Some of them I don't like as much as others. Hopefully right. everything I put forward I like, but they're favorites. So just by saying to them, let's begin by eliminating what you don't like. And if they won't do it, I'll do it. And I'll say, okay, well, I don't like the third one as much as some of the others. Hmm. And then immediately they're in and they say, yeah, I don't like that one either. And right. then we've broken this sort of 
porcelain moment of like perfection that I have to love everything you've made. Sure. We can't speak honestly with each other. And then we just go, and then you can really narrow down to, okay, now we have four things. And then that's a legitimate conversation. I usually give people time. They take it away. They show, you know, nine members of their family, you know, like, yeah. you know, stuff yeah. happens, but, um, hmm. but, and I'll try and be passionate. I'm more that way now, but I'll say this, this one's, this is, I think this is the right one. Right. I used to not do that. I used to just be like happy if they were happy. Hmm. That's, that's uh, interesting. I'd, I'd like to uh, learn more about the psychology of why putting a stamp of approval would be more difficult than uh, being critical. That's, that's interesting. Somehow it's easier for people. I think actually that the subtleties between several things they like takes more time to evaluate yeah. versus things they don't like. It's, um, a, a really, the, my, my COO, um, who's now retired and running a donut shop in Idaho, um, <laughs> who's a great, great guy. He, um, oh, wait, I just lost my train of thought. What is it that he used to do that was so good about that, the eliminating down? Oh, we'll have to come back to it in your cardiac because I just lost my train of thought on this thing that he, he taught me something about. Oh, I know. I, of course, I remember. He said that uh, much of life is editing. And he said that uh, when you get your mail, I say this to students often, when you get your mail, the first thing that you do with your mail is see how much of it you can throw out. Mm -hmm. It's really true. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Uh, I think it's true for everyone because you'd like to get down to the few things that you really need to consider because it takes your time. And I think that's actually true of design and advertising. That you're sort of like watching all these ads on TV and you're really not interested in all the ones that are boring or suck or yeah, yeah. all the same COVID ads that we're seeing suddenly. They're not actually now. Maybe the first one was impressive with the piano and the thing and the first person to get it right. But now they all look exactly the same. And so nobody's really breaking through. Mm -hmm. No one really has that much to say other than we feel bad. And Okay. Um, so... You know, editing, you know, editing, it's really good to think about that. How are you going to be one of the last things in the mail stack? Mm. How are you going to be something that stays with somebody? Yeah, that's, uh, I, I am going, I'm going through the process of trying to determine if there is a God. And I decided to approach uh, my religious beliefs with a editor's perspective. If, if I can remove anything on the basis of it being, of human creation, I'm eliminating it. And at the end, see what's left. And yeah, that's. I that's, like that you're market shopping. Well, I, it's, I, I'm done with, uh, I, I no, such a deep con long conversation, yeah, but I think religions like are, podcast. I have another podcast. It's all about this, stuff. <laughs> but it's, it's basically, I think religion is a form of ideology, which is just a large degree mirroring of yourself, which becomes a graven image. It's just something that you can control to have an extension of yourself and your ideas and control. And there's, if there is something out there, um, there's a lot of wisdom and not turning it into something solid or rigid, lest it become a reflection of ourselves and not continue to grow. So um, yeah, whole different deal, but, um, uh, two more questions for you. Uh, creative block. What do you do to get out of that? If you distract yourself, honestly, go running skiing, skiing is really good for me. Uh, obviously it's only certain times of the year. <laughs> Sailing's really good for me. Yep. I have this little 12 and a half hair shop and so if I can get an activity that engages me physically, mm -hmm. then I have to put all my attention on that skiing and sailing. Do that. Like I have to, yep. I'm not good enough at either one that I can just do them and then write a thesis while I do them. Right. So once I get all my energies focused on that, then it'll just go bing and it'll come, it'll come, it'll just pop in. So I why I, that is, I, I hundred percent agree with you and have you experienced get your that faculties on something else and, yeah. then, and then how is it the idea happen. and the solution is there but if you just shut up it comes out you know like this process of engaging yeah. yourself physically makes your mind shut up and the idea 
and the solution's already in there and it comes out when you shut up. That's I think that's true. I'm much better at, you know, if you gave me the problem now, coming up with it the next 30 minutes than I am like I'm on this process now that's gonna be months long. And I uh there's another big piece that's coming out in the fall that we've been working on for a year and a half. I find it harder to maintain. Like, am I done? Am I done? Are there more ideas? Should mm. there be more ideas? Or in the parameters change? I find it easier to just spot, you know, have a moment where you're like, let's make it orange. Oh, it'd be cool, orange. Okay, great, orange it is. And the way you go. Right. I like it better, faster than. So that's the, to me, where I'm at now in my career, the hardest part is solving it and then stepping back and going, are there other solves? Are there things I haven't thought of? You know, because you're trying to get better. You're trying to grow. So just dropping into your comfort zone isn't always how you're going to move forward into the next thing. Mm -hmm. So that's, but that's different than block. That's more like, how do you grow? Right. You know, block, I just need to, I just need to occupy myself a little bit and something will, something will show up and then right. you grab a pencil and write it down. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with you and haven't experienced that as well. Um, as, as closing, rounding this out, uh, Broadway and Corona, how do you think those are going to, how do you think that's going to resolve and, and move forward? Cause intrinsically you got to come together in a group to, to you know, experience the magic of Broadway. Different. I keep trying to imagine it's different now than it was in, in the beginning, having, having gone through nine 11 and mm -hmm. knowing what that was. And I actually thought it might have been over then. I thought, okay, people aren't going to feel safe in the theater. Eh, it's done. And how quickly it came back. That people's, people's resiliency is kind of amazing, right? People mm -hmm. are amazingly able to respond and come back. And the other side of that is, not the same side of that is the point of view of, yes, we've all been in this fear moment, but when, when it starts to really drop, which I think when this runs in July, hopefully will be really, really much further down, right? Right now, right. New York is just cresting. It's where we are right now. Yep. It's, it's going down. Maine is going down, but just a little. Mm -hmm. But when it really starts to go down, I'm trying to think about what will that energy be, right? Because that energy will have been pent up. And I think that right. energy will be incredibly yeah. positive. That energy will be like, okay, there's hope for the future. Let's go. And what people do with that energy is fascinating. On the other hand, People do have to feel safe. And so we are going to have to get to a place where we reassure the safeness of what's happening. Right. And so whether people wear masks or whether we have a treatment, I mean, that could, we could be there, right? We mm -hmm. could easily be there where it's been shown that something people are doing that they're all studying right now is helping, not a, not a cure, but a, but a reasonable treatment. That would make a big difference in people feeling like, what they were taking on was less risky. So it's not a matter of, of will, it's a matter of when, you know I mean? I, I'm not at all worried whether Broadway will go on. I'm a little worried as to when Broadway can go on because just like every other small business, we could lose a lot of them mm. and a lot of people could lose money and a lot of, it could take a long time to recover. So hoping to bring back Broadway sooner rather than later. I mean, right now, sooner would be, I think, widely agreed upon the fall. Yeah. Um, but it could be later. Um, but, you know, and then I get all into it. And then I think, you know what? It'll be our, one way or another. It'll be back. It'll be the thing we love. It will be, it will be okay. It just may take a little bit longer than mm. we think. I mean, I'm so lucky to be here in Maine. And have a place to go, you know, and have a summer and not be around that many people anyways. Yeah. So, uh, I feel really, I keep saying to people right now, well, acknowledging that the world is completely a mess right now, my life is okay. <laughs> it's pretty cozy here in Maine. So <laughs> I'm, I'm okay, you know? And so I can only deal with sort of how I have empathy for other people's, people's experiences, but kind of be in mind. Right. And right now, mine is okay, and um, hopefully, we'll be back in the fall because we really could use that. What do you uh, 
I know I said it was the last question, but you sparked another one. Um, any massive disruption creates opportunity. And um, what is the opportunity in this for Broadway, you think? Yeah, nobody knows yet. I mean, really, nobody knows yet. Um, I don't know what the opportunity is. It's not obvious. Right now, there are no clear i mean it's it's an opportunity for teleconferencing you know mm -hmm. people are all going to get used to doing that and yeah. suddenly everybody's going to be like why weren't we doing that all the time right and uh that's clear and uh it could be an opportunity for uh us to recognize healthcare workers and us to recognize people who uh you know economic disparity and that seems like an opportunity um and um, maybe it'll be an opportunity that we really miss being with each other because That's everybody is really missing that right now. Yeah. And I do feel like Broadway at its best is about an experience that happens when you're all in the room having the same yeah. experience. Yeah. It's not like a movie where you're all in a room having the same experience independently. Mm. It's sort of a collaborative. We're all here. We all gasp at once when that happens on stage or we all applaud and jump up together. So maybe there'll be more value in, you know, it's not the same until we're together. Maybe that will really be. Yeah. I wonder if this will highlight, um, the it'll, it'll highlight that experience of observing something as a group and what, what that is. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. And some of it is just like, you know, your brain is sort of built to forget pain. Like some of it is just coming back to, you know, we're remarkably good at recovering mm -hmm. and, you know, you're sort of built that way to recover. So I don't, necessarily know that i think there'll be some magic thing that comes out of this but i think the the pain will be forgotten you know relatively reasonably once people are safe again that it will be like remember when we didn't feel safe i think that will right i mean that's yeah. how it is i keep looking back the spanish flu 1918 yeah, yeah worse really than this uh from what worse i can than this uh well, and then. then there was the roaring 20s you know, right after it. I don't, right. I don't, I don't, it's not that I think that that won't happen. I do think that, you know, I think about our restaurants here in Portland and how much that, uh, that's a big part of what I love about here is the, yeah. raw, the, the outdoor rawness of the state and then the sophistication of the things that exist. The and restaurants so, here are incredible. So I, I fear, uh, I want those people to be able to hang in there because they make, my life really joyful here right. and really more sophisticated yep. than people think it is. Yeah. You know, people from away sometimes think Maine is sort of like wonderfully rustic. And I'm like, yeah, not so rustic, pretty sophisticated place. Yeah. So, um, um, but Broadway, um, I mean, maybe people will realize how much we need it. I know after nine 11 that there was this immediate feeling that the country, and I mean the federal government, wanted to say that New York was open for business. Mm -hmm. And that Broadway turned out to be their best voice for saying that. Hmm. So there yeah. was a moment when like sort of the federal government seemed to realize that they really needed Broadway, which is not something that Broadway always feels. Hmm. Um, certainly not from this resident. Um, so... <laughs> It'll be interesting to, no, I mean, really, this is just not an arts president. Like yeah, there are presidents yeah. who are really using uh, the arts and going out to the arts. That's not this one. So, you know, I've actually been at Broadway shows with Donald Trump, but um, in the old days, but uh, I don't think he goes. So I don't think he, uh, it, it's not necessarily important to him. So maybe other people will really see its value. Yeah. In, in its, it's certainly incredibly valuable to New York's economy. And yeah. Well, to me, it, it just comes that Broadway, in some sense, is this extremely ancient art form that obviously has value and is stuck around forever. And it is, you know, the, the pinnacle of it, it seems, is in this one area and very prominent in the world there. It's like right there. And it's uh it's just a cultural uh 
it's a cultural mountaintop, you know? I have and, to say, London is really suffering too. And the West End, you know, there's no better theater than the theater that they, the National Theater and the other mm -hmm. theater there. And they are in the same spot and they're struggling as well. Yeah. So my friends there would say, oh, sure, Broadway. You know, you didn't mention us. So right. <laughs> uh, I love London and what they do. So it's theater. And and frankly, there are so many theaters around the country and they're all shut too. And that yeah. whole circuit of people getting their theater when it comes to Houston or Denver or wherever they are, mm -hmm. um, that's they're They're really worried too. Hopefully some of those places will be able to open maybe even sooner than New York because they, you know, because they're a little more protected. Right. Uh, but I'm not sure. We have a pretty strong community theater right here in Biddeford, actually. A really nice renovated uh, theater that uh, they just renovated when I moved to town, actually. So, And true to my form, I've never been to anything there. <laughs> <laughs> Introvert, so whatever. But um, this has been a really interesting conversation to me to, to look Thanks into a part of our society and life that I really don't know much about, but the overlaps of creativity and and production of art as, as a means of, of getting the word out there about something important is really interesting. So really appreciate you uh, taking the time to come down, sit down and talk. And thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It was, uh, it was uh, fun to have a July conversation <laughs> in the last flakes of April. Yeah, the last flakes of April. That's true. Yeah, hopefully those were the last. So yeah, yeah, they're gone. Great. Thank you. All right. Thanks.